be here this evening with you um, to support IPA uh, and in particular Mark Birrell who uh, sits alongside me at, uh, on the IPA Advisory Council and to be in the presence of so many of you who are critical to our infrastructure journey here in Australia. Looking around the room this evening, um, I see that many of the guests here are in what used to be called in their prime. It's that time of life when we know what has to be done and we've got just enough energy left to do it. <laughs> Infrastructure. We know successful economies, successful communities are built on first-class infrastructure. Infrastructure hard and soft. Soft infrastructure, as I call it. Education, health, the rule of law. Hard infrastructure, areas where many of us make our way. Transport, power, water, telecommunication. Infrastructure that enables economic success and underpins the quality of our daily lives. We also know that many Western countries have underinvested in hard infrastructure over the last 30 to 40 years. And it shows. It shows in parts of Europe, parts of North America, and in some places here in Australia. We've not just underinvested in new infrastructure to keep pace with population growth, but we've underinvested in the maintenance and upkeep of existing infrastructure too. In the United States of America, the engineering community recently estimated that the backlog, the maintenance backlog, and the building backlog of infrastructure in the US is 11 trillion US dollars. Now think about that. The US economy has an annual GDP of 15 trillion dollars. Australia has an annual GDP of about 1 trillion dollars. And they estimate the backlog to be something like 11 trillion US dollars. So much has to be done. Estimates here in Australia of the infrastructure backlog range from somewhere between 200 to 700 billion Australian dollars. And it's going to be three decades at least before we get back to where we could be and should be. So who's going to build this? Traditionally, of course, Stephen's already touched on this, governments, both federal and state, have built our hard infrastructure. But we recognise that it's increasingly difficult for governments, both state and federal, to continue to do that because of their limited capacity to pay. Dr Ken Henry uh, late last year spoke and he made the point that since Gough Whitlam became our Prime Minister in 1972, the spending on soft infrastructure, on health, on education, on social security and welfare, the key soft infrastructure areas, and in 1972 that was just under 30 per cent of total federal government spending. Today it's about 60 per cent of total government spending. In 1972 spending on those soft infrastructure areas represented about 6 per cent of GDP. Today it's over 16 per cent of GDP. So what does this mean? Because these are important areas of spend. What it means is there's less to spend on the hard infrastructure which underpins economic growth. To make matters worse, as governments get into debt around the, the globe, they're increasingly borrowing in the same capital markets that private sector companies are to build infrastructure. They're crowding out private sector investment. That too is a challenge. As Stephen has said, is no doubt in my mind, I don't think any doubt in the minds of any of us here today, that the private sector has to take on an increased role. But there are some challenges here, and you don't need to look too far to find them. We know that the PPP model works, but it doesn't always work. Historically, uh, governments have asked the private sector to take all the risks up front and to live on a utility rent, to take the construction risk, to take the patronage risk and to live on reasonably meagre returns. That model doesn't work. Capital is infinitely mobile and if it's going to invest in infrastructure, it doesn't have to invest in greenfield sites. They can invest in brownfield sites. They can invest overseas. They don't have to invest in Australia. So there's a lot to be done if we're going to encourage more investment from the private sector into infrastructure generally. What is abundantly clear 
is that if we are to find a positive way forward, we'll need to make greater use of mankind's wisdom, inventiveness and entrepreneurial spirit. So many of the problems of today require innovative solutions if we are to build workable tomorrows. Let's think about that. In energy, there's a substantial amount of work being done on carbon capture and storage. The jury's out, but it's an important technological uh, area and if it can work it will make a substantial difference. What about photovoltaics, the turning of sunshine into electricity? Substantial amount of work has been done in that area too. In many countries nuclear energy is seen as an important part of the energy mix. But the energy, the nuclear reactors of today, the third and fourth generation reactors are very different to the early Magnox gas cooled reactors that were built in Britain and at Chernobyl. Telecommunications. We've seen enormous advance. Fibre, wireless communications, the internet, the way in which mobile phones work. There's a huge variety of content available. Video conferencing, the use of Skype, technologies that are with us today, technologies that came to us through innovation. Transport, the new vehicles that will help, I'm sure, to address some of the carbon challenges that have plagued the motor car, trains and planes and aircraft. And there are many things we haven't even thought of. We can do it, and when I reflect on the industry where I've spent most of my work, working life aviation, and look how far we've come in a century, it's almost beyond our ability to comprehend what is truly possible. This evening I thought I'd take us back for a few moments to 1903 and that dark and windy hilltop, the strangely named Kill Devil Hill at Kitty Hawk, where two brothers were engaged in their fantastic futuristic experiment, powered flight. Just over 100 years ago, before computers, before jet engines, before radar, before Don Bradman, before Gallipoli, and just after the death of Queen Victoria. The world was very primitive according to our lights and enormously advanced according to theirs. The Western world had industrialised and commercialised and globalised. Free trade, free travel. You could still happily travel without a passport in 1903, to say nothing of airport security searches. Around the beginning of the 20th century, Wilbur Wright was quoted as saying he didn't believe powered flight would be possible for another 50 years, but he did believe it would be possible. He wrote, um, my disease has increased in severity. He referred to it as a sickness, his love of aviation, and I feel that it will soon cost me an increased amount of money, if not my life. Yes, the money. That's something we recognise today. A modern jet passenger aircraft costs over 300 million US dollars and it has 6 million working parts. A single bulkhead will have a thousand technical drawings attached to it. But the world's first aeroplane was built in a bicycle shop by two designers and a machinist. The designers scramped up drawings on pieces of waste paper which the machinist would nail to the workbench. When we see their struts and wires and fragile wings, we can understand why the first planes were called kites. There were no seat belts on the first plane because there were no seats. The pilot lay on the fuselage. The ensemble was powered by a 16 horsepower engine weighing about as much as I do. The top speed they were aiming at was around 30 miles an hour. They'd been practicing flying in their glider. What backyard, garden shed, workbench heroism it all seems like now. Uh, 